All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stash, and welcome to sunny Tel Aviv. It's about 7 p.m. our time, uh, 7.04 in classic uh, Tel Aviv fashion, starting four minutes late. I apologize for that. Uh, great to have you all with us. Um, we just wanted to give some people extra time to, to join in and uh, get everything going. Uh, wonderful. So uh, just before we get started, um, just a quick uh, you know, question. Uh, where's everybody coming from? If anybody would like to tell us in the chat, we'd love to know uh, where people are connecting from today. It's always fun to uh, connect with the global community here. Excellent. DC, amazing. Boston, all right. Seattle, Ireland, nice. Madrid, another DC. Texas, Norway, New York, New York, a couple New York, California. The UK. I love it. I love it. It's amazing. So it's it's so great that we have people from all over the world because really privacy is becoming uh, more and more a global standard. And uh, that's really, to be honest, what what we here at Mine are all about. We're about, to be honest, making privacy easy, making it accessible uh, for individuals, for companies. It's what makes me passionate about this company, making it something which is something that's empowering, uh, something that's no longer challenging, not something that people are going to be staying up at night worrying, you know, and that's really exciting to know that you're making a difference, that you're helping a company be able to uh, compete and, and go out there and be able to achieve their dream and not be held back because they're concerned and worried, but being able to give them sort of the peace of mind and the software and the guidance to be able to tackle uh, any of these challenges um, and really provide a fantastic uh, service and uh, experience for their consumers. So we've got a really amazing lineup uh, for today. I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen and just walk you through a couple quick notes about us and then I'm gonna pass it on. Um, just uh, let me know uh, that you guys can see my screen okay and uh, we're gonna get started. Can everybody see my screen? Yes? All right, awesome. So yeah, so uh, today's webinar is all about thriving in the new privacy era. And we don't think that this is at all something that people need to be worried about and concerned with. I think that it's all about just understanding uh, exactly what these regulations are, understanding how they can manage these regulations and still at the same time accomplish their business needs and provide a fantastic customer experience. You know, uh, I always like to say that in business, it's all really just about intelligence, integrity, and drive. I wasn't the first person to say that. It's actually a lot of much smarter people than me have kind of said that and agree on it. And really, you know, when you think about intelligence, you think about integrity and you think about drive, that all comes down to providing a great service for your customers, providing a great value. And that's something that you always want to be able to do. And at the same time, you want to do it correctly, correctly for them, correctly from a regulation standpoint correctly from a business standpoint and so all of us always need to think about this and how we possibly can best manage it um, today we're really lucky we have alex with us uh, from goose chase who's the uh, head of legal and finance and operations uh, so uh, he'll be speaking uh, first uh, we also have as well matt uh, who's the lead integrations engineer at splendid spoon who will be speaking second and then lastly we have with us yuta williams who's really a fantastic privacy and security expert, really focusing specifically into this area for a long period of time, formerly from Google and Facebook and Twitter. And you know, it's really great to have her with us, as well as Matt and Alex, who can really bring together, I think, all the different flavors and understandings around the space and how it kind of relates to them. Cool, so just quickly a little bit about Mine. Uh, so Mine was founded uh, really to shape the new future of data ownership and really provide transparency, equal choice and control to the internet. So uh, our founders come from a deep cyber background, a deep consumer background, and they were able to really understand that there was something that was missing in the space, um, that people really were having trouble to be able to understand where their data was, and also organizations as well were having trouble understand where their information was, what type of information was there, and uh, to be honest, you know, the average uh, company is not one of these massive um, California tech companies that can throw hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars and years and a whole army of people on a project. And uh, 
to be honest, the other solutions that were in the space were being told to us were kind of lacking that sense of easy automation, customization, and being affordable. So the founders took it upon themselves to kind of uh, provide that to the space, to the business space, also the consumer space. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, it's been a really great journey, um, a lot of fun and really helping people, which makes you feel really good at night. Um, essentially what we do is we help basically individuals and companies to be able to discover where their data is, understand it, and to be able to make actions and control. So obviously we have a massive, uh, user community into the consumer space. We also have a growing, uh, community into the business space as well. Um, we created that business space actually out of request by our customers, uh, or rather by these companies, uh, before they were our customers who were saying that this sort of solution was, was lacking, uh, that they kind of needed something which was going to be light yet powerful. And, uh, also really having a team that was there 24 hours a day, helping them and not, you know, uh, making it difficult. And so we really wanted to be that team. We really wanted to provide that for them. And, uh, and they're all very happy with us uh, and recommending their friends and it's growing and that's really exciting. Um, so uh, what is Mind Privacy Ops? So we are again mentioning, you know, streamlining automation and managing. It's all really about making it really simple and easy. So we really want privacy to be simple. We want it to be easy. We want it to be something that people are able to, you know, go ahead and take care of without feeling that they need to, uh, you know, block hours and hours out of their time, you know, get tons of uh, people into the room. That's something that they're just going to be able to, you know, streamline into the way that they operate today. Um, we always believe that, you know, data discovery is really the foundation, uh, both for the consumer and for the business, which is to really understand where is my data and something that we do that's really unique is we do a data source discovery, which is real time and automated. And to be honest, it's so quick, the way that we do it, that we're able to provide results in four minutes, not four months, not any long period of time, four minutes. And I always say that's really important because if I'm looking for my keys, uh, I can't wait four hours. I'm going to miss the birthday party. You know, it's really important to have that quick time to value. So we really are proud of that. Uh, we also provide a data source inventory. So after we've discovered what those data sources are, we let you know these are the based on machine learning recommendations of that's the type of information that's there. But we can actually go a step further by providing PII tracing, which is going to give us the ability to actually do an automated uh, accuracy. So what that means is, for example, here at Mine, we provide customer support on intercom again, 24 hours a day, six days a week. Uh, and we don't ask for email. Uh, I'm sorry. We don't ask for telephone. Now, the reason why we don't do that is because we actually provide all of our customer support either over the intercom or over zoom. Uh, so we haven't really had a need to do, uh, phone calls. So phone numbers are supposed to be in HubSpot and intercom is just supposed to be name and email from our ROPA perspective you know, in terms of what's the information that's there. Now with our PII tracing, we're actually able to go in and understand that actually in intercom, we had a couple phone numbers. So we're able to understand why were those phone numbers there? Okay. It was because the customer had offered the phone number and then we sent them the zoom link. So then we're able to go ahead and make sure that we delete those and then, you know, have those phone numbers in HubSpot where they're supposed to be. So that sort of easy sort of governance kind of activity can be done through having the PII tracing. Uh, also, you know, it allows for us to just have that extra sense of confidence that we know where the information is and also giving some level of data to what's the level of privacy risk that we have in a data source, not just on a whimsical idea, but actually in a real time moment. So if we see all of a sudden much more uh, data points uh, that are sensitive, for example, financial information and other things appearing in a certain data source, we can go ahead and rank it as one of our more uh, you know, I don't want to say risky, but, you know, potentially sensitive data sources where we might want to add a, a higher level of threshold for, um, you know, cyber posture or for, uh, access control. So that's where the PII tracing comes in. And of course, all of this is tying into the ROPA to be able to provide us a one click ROPA report, which is really great because we don't want the ROPA to be something which is, you know, taking hours and, 
of, of, of each person's day and then, you know, having to send off, you know, Excel sheets and chasing after people. So what we're able to do with our automated discovery is to ask the business owner to confirm, you know, what we found in terms of the uh, inventory, they can confirm it, it gets added to the ROPA. And then, for example, then when we want to ask them, are they still in use? And they say, no, we can remove it just like that. So it makes that process uh, really easy and quite automated. Um, of course, we handle data subject requests such as deletion, copy, access, do not share and do not sell. Uh, we are able to actually provide consent management onto the privacy intake form. So some people prefer that than having a cookie banner for the United States. That's a conversation that we can have and some customers are really enjoying that. Um, and of course, we really believe in providing a golden rule where we can. So obviously we know sometimes certain things need to be done for GDPR, such as opting in versus opting out, but there are other things such as handling the deletion request or an access request, which really there's no reason to handle them any differently uh, just because one is 45 days, one is 30 days, or if you're in Brazil and it's 15, there's really no benefit to your business in holding off. So we always say with the automation, let's just you know, process a request um, to the fullest, whether somebody's in a region that has those requests um, or rights rather versus doesn't, we get to spend less time in terms of you know, the categorization per request and it's just karma, right? So, you know, do good and good comes back to you. All right, uh, just a quick reminder that of course, under um, Apple, we are supposed to provide a single API call deletion, right? A one-click deletion. So we know that that was kind of pushed out, but ultimately that's something that we're gonna hear uh, Alex talk about, you know, in the uh, in the consumer app that, that he has. Um, and that's something that we do support uh, and we're really excited about it. And, uh, and yeah, so questions and answers um, at any time during the, during the call, during the call, please feel free to jump in with a question. Uh, we'll answer it as real time as we can. If not, we'll handle it at the end. And uh, yeah, let's uh, get on with the show uh, to the other speakers. So uh, with that, um, Alex, uh, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, for sure. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Amazing. Uh, yeah, so hi. Um joining from uh from the south of france the company is based in toronto i'm in nice at the moment so it's 6 p.m it's almost time for wine so uh let's get uh let, let's get this done so we can go back to our, to our amazing duty so hi i'm alex uh head of legal finance and operations at uh, goose chase adventures my background is really in law and finance uh, but for the past few years i've leveraged kind of this knowledge together with uh more technical kind of data knowledge as well to transform goose chase into uh the well-oiled machine that it is uh, today so what is goose chase goose chase is an uh, online platform originally inspired by scavenger hunt uh but now we're really operating in the interactive experience world uh and that basically what we do our platform enables organizations and schools uh to really engage activate and educate their communities through really fun interactive experiences so initially goose chase was hatched in 2011 uh, and we're a very different business back then. Initially, when we started, we were very much B2C. Uh, but in 2013, 14, uh, a major phone company asked us if we could help them out uh, for a fun team building game. And at that moment, we realized that we ought to actually switch towards a more uh, B2B business. And eventually, what we realized is that essentially we are B2B to B to C. Uh, and the last part being the C part is relevant here that because whilst our financial customers, so to speak, our real customers definitely are the businesses, are the organization, our end users are members of the public, which I'm sure we'll talk about it a bit. And that uh, presents itself with a myriad of legal issues and challenges. So yeah, that's, that's us. Excellent. So uh, I'm going to just ask a couple questions just to kind of guide us through the, uh, the session a little bit. That's okay with you, Alex? For sure. So wonderful. So uh, can you just describe uh, a little bit, you know, just kind of uh, a little bit about the goose chase story, a little bit about, you know, yourself. I know you did just now, but just if you could just a little bit about kind of, you know, how goose chase was founded and, and anything unique about goose chase. Yeah, for sure. So we're incredibly fortunate to have a product that was really built and emanated from the creativity of our customers rather than, say, the 
the the genius of our product developers uh and that really we've kind of iterated our product to kind of fit uh fit our customer needs and expectations and as such really over the years we have acquired a myriad of customers types customer types right so really ranging from school districts where they use us predominantly uh, to have fun assignments and homework for their students, uh, to we're also cater to well-known museums and amusement parks where they use us to have the guests discover uh, their parks and just their, their, their surface in a more engaging uh, fashion. And so that's already one cohort. And we it goes all the way to now we also cater and enormously to uh, military branches. They use us in a totally different way to run uh, training and and a more engaging way, so just capture the capture the flag and so forth. And finally, we also have a lot of Fortune 500 companies that can use us a different way for more team building and uh, onboarding, right? So then board a lot of their staff through ways that are more engaging, more interactive. Um, and so yeah, that you can start to appreciate uh, the complexities uh, of both our customer base and their respective users, and how they use our platform in ways that trigger dozens and dozens of privacy laws and internal uh, compliance issues for them. So yeah, we've definitely had to find a place around that. Yeah, so that sounds really interesting that you have such a, a wide sort of customer and user base. So can you just like describe a little bit, just a tiny bit about, you know, do you guys view yourself really as like a business to consumer, a business to business, and just any interesting or unique challenges that you kind of face there and any funny stories maybe? Yeah, for sure. So we, we're very much, we, we, you know, whether we want it or not, we're very much B2B to B to C for all legal in, intents and purposes, uh, where we, our main customers are the businesses, say a Fortune 500 companies, uh, a Fortune 500 company, and we've had that recently, where we've had during an onboarding activity uh, held by a decently big company, one of their students, uh, which was basically a, a, an intern, um, allegedly did something that was rather embarrassing. So of course we give them all the tools to delete any uh, such submission, but they also, also wanted to make sure of course that that information was deleted from, from our, from our uh, books, of course. Uh, so we jumped on that as well to make sure that any such record was, was kind of dealt with uh, in, probably, I think it took us less than four hours to do with, which was actually pretty fast. Um, and so, yeah, similarly, we have a lot of um, personal and, and law enforcement. And so we have to ensure that the data that they have is dealt with in a way, uh, in a way that is incredibly safe and, and incredibly secure at all times, both from the moment of inception, the moment that data comes to us, uh, to, to us, sorry, to the moment that we do away with it. So this entire process from start to finish has to be dealt with in ways that is uh, quite delicate. Yeah. So what was that exact moment or can you think of one that you kind of felt like, okay, we need a privacy solution and what did it kind of look like, uh, before you had mine? What did, what, what, what was privacy? Yeah, for sure. So, so what we initially created was a, was a really good kind of patch was a, was a good bridge at first based on the legislative framework that existed at the time. So basically when you join one of our games, you can either create an account and of course you just need email, username, passwords, pretty straightforward stuff. Um, but because we also have a lot of minors using apps, such as students, primary school students and so forth, we had to make sure that really we anonymized the data from the moment it got onto our service in the first place. So we created the guest account and by using the guest account, um, users just use a join, uh, 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 join a, a game through a join code. Uh, and that's about it. So we don't actually have any PII on them, on our users from, from the, the get go, but that became quite difficult when the legislative framework around that was no, not only about kind of how we process the data and how we get in the first place, but then how we dispose of it, how we transfer that, how we delete it. How do we delete data if we don't actually know who the person is? How do we transfer the data if we have already anonymized? Uh, the person we actually cannot trace it to another account so that really became an issue and uh this is where we kind of sought help a bit from a third party uh from mine effectively to uh to do so in a way that was as efficient as our initial ingestion of data so yeah amazing so yeah so uh, i guess just the last thing that i i kind of ask is kind of like what was important to you? What what did that process look like? How did you find us? And uh, 
And ultimately, if you could just kind of tell us a little bit about your journey with mine. Yeah, for sure. So really, um, initially, it emanated from a legislative change in the US, whereby um, most, well, all uh, school districts now have to uh, dispose of uh, data in a prompt and swift fashion. Therefore, we are, by extension, having to do that as well. And that was a bit of a, of a challenge. So we sought help from, uh, from mine. Through, and basically what we've done is, especially now it's very topical with uh, Apple's uh, deletion re request as well. Now, basically we created through um, our API, we basically linked both our API and the API of mine, whereby now any user, anytime, whether they're a guest account or a normal account can uh, trigger a deletion request in the app itself that both nukes and wipes out all the data that we goose chase have on them and then if there are any traces of that linking back to say intercom so for instance even if they're guest accounts they might be able to kind of get in touch with customer support so that will also be nuked on the other end as well and so for us to not only ensure that the data on such participants is deleted both on our end but also on the end for which we're responsible for which is our setup processes that was really important and so we've done that in a very kind of tech savvy way directly to the API, uh, which was actually decent to work with. So that was yeah. a decent shout challenge. Out, shout out to our R and D team. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. So, uh, so excellent. So, so that's really great. Um, if anybody does have any questions for Alex, you know, he'll be, um, sticking around with us. Uh, we really appreciate, you know, sharing your story. Um, just cause we have uh, a lot more, I think we're going to now, uh, move on to, uh, to Matt and, uh, thanks again, Alex for uh, sharing your journey. It's, uh, it's really inspiring. It's really amazing. It's a phenomenal app. And I forgot to mention, we will have a quiz at the end and the top 20 or 30%, we haven't yet decided, uh, winners are going to receive uh, both a Splendid Spoon care package and also uh, a game uh, from Goose Chase uh, free of charge. So uh, that's always fun as well. We like, uh, we like our customers and we love our customers loving uh, our participants too. Awesome. Moving on. So, uh, so thanks again, Alex. And, uh, and Matt, up to you. Excellent. Yeah, great to so, be here. Thanks, Alex. Um, and yeah, just Sorry. hopping in. No, no, no. All good. <laughs> Is the connection sound good? Everyone hears yeah, me? yeah. It's, it's my fault. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'm Matt. I'm the lead integrations engineer at Splendid Spoon, and Splendid Spoon itself uh, is a direct to consumer, plant based uh, meal company. And what that means from like the end user's point of view is that uh, they can order smoothies and noodle bowls and soups and grain bowls, lots of really delicious things that are uh, vegan, vegetarian, and really use it any way they want. A lot of people use it to build habits or to introduce plant-based eating into the life for the first time. Um, so I've been working with the team for about three years, and uh, what three years looks like in calendar view is going through CCPA uh, for the first time and, and roll out together here with this team, um, but also doing a lot of things in between. And um, my individual background is as a, a software developer, initially building open source crowdfunding tools. And what that led to, you know, that's back 10 years ago now, but um, what that looked like in my career was um, building tools that people use to do self hosted Kickstarter campaigns. And eventually like as the, the shift went to pre-orders, I was working with a company called Boosted Boards in uh, 2016, 2017, around the time that the, the GDPR enforcement was really ramping up. Um, and the team was expanding from shipping these electric skateboards only in the US to internationally. And what that meant at the time was my individual uh, excitement around personal privacy in my own life meant that I was tasked for the first time uh, in a business role of implementing policy that had been written in uh, a place far away from me located in the US and San Francisco at the time uh, and making sure that we were compliant. And through that whole process, ended up learning the, the level of investment required from individual contributors to implement things well. Uh, and really that it meant working with legal teams much more than it meant solving complex technical problems. Um, and really enjoyed that process uh, you know, as, as much as someone could um, and kind of took on this role in future companies of getting a request that's like, hey, can we install a cookie banner? We need to be compliant for CCPA and being the one to go, well, you know, we should, should probably start with legal stuff because, you know, that the cookie banner is not the whole thing there. Um, and yeah, have, have taken my career in 
and that way working on tons of integrations um, with third parties across more than just privacy. Uh, but yeah, ended up working on CCPA automation, building initial versions of Splendid Spoon CCPA flow through Google Forms and managing them individually myself, uh, which from a you know, developer point of view, it's maybe not the most high leverage way that I could use my time. And so eventually ran into the Mind business platform and uh, I've had a good time using it and excited to share uh, what it's looked like for us. And uh, yeah, anything else I can add to this? this? Yeah, amazing. So, uh, so, so just like with Alex, I'm just going to ask a couple questions, um, which I think could, could be really interesting for people. So the first one that I would ask is, you know, can you kind of uh, describe um, what the privacy practice looked like uh, before you started working with mine? And just a little bit about exactly how it was that you kind of found yourself taking care of privacy uh, at Splendid Spoon. Sure. Yeah. So again, we're, we're in 2020 pandemic and trying to to find time to uh, implement something that was starting to be required by our advertisers. And so that's really where a lot of the enforcement happens for direct to consumer stuff is that the advertising companies will say, where's your, you know, do not sell my information link at the bottom. You got to have that. And so you start from there and, and kind of work your way out. And so the, the way that we started in Vigil and RN was a position paper written based on research that I could do, the tech team could do, the marketing team could do ourselves. And that ends up being the most efficient way for us to work with our legal team of like, here's our perspective on what we've learned and just showing that we've done the homework. And then our, our legal team will look at it and say like, okay, here's some gaps. Here's how other teams are dealing with it. And we're delivering only to US customers. So it's a, a new scope for us. And we're only looking at, at California uh, in the CCPA at the time, but that was kind of how we started. And from there we decided on, okay, we're not going to have often cookie banners. We're going to use Google forms and we're going to process these requests as they come in through manual workflows for, for all three types. So, uh, you know, do not sell and, uh, delete, delete data and inform. And so we did that for about a year and what it looked like, you know, number of requests will probably withhold is information on our end, but it, it meant that we ended up spending multiple hours per month uh, of a developer that could go grab and delete data from different systems uh, and get everything. But, you know, we were concerned about were we getting absolutely everything? Where was data from third parties getting shot around from some of our data warehouses and things? So we were, were pretty sure that we were getting everything, but our, our logs were essentially Google Sheets and Gmail automations within people's individual inboxes and ran across mine uh, as a way for us to uh, to scale that. Even if not in a click button, everything's solved for us way. I don't think that's how we think about privacy. It's like an ongoing thing, but from the point of view of uh, covering all our bases and making sure that we're auditable for next round of funding, et cetera. 100%. So is it, how was it that you found out about mine? What was the, uh, the thing that introduced you? Yeah, so, you know, mine, we've come to learn is, is a pretty smart company The the way that the, the consumer product was working was that it was, uh, if, if I as a consumer signed up for mine, to try and delete as much information I could around the web, mine, the consumer product shoots out an automated email, it says, Hey, Splendid Spoon, you've sent me a marketing email before, can you delete my data from your system? And so we saw a few of these and at first was like, okay, like this is a little bit frustrating because I can't verify if the users are in California. You know, I wanted to take care of the request regardless of where they were. Like it's easy enough for us to respect privacy of not sending marketing emails anymore. Um, but when I looked into the, the business solution that existed, it really started to check all the boxes of what we were looking for of will they integrate with that email platform we use or they integrate with that ad platform that we use. Uh, and so that, that's how I found it actually was the, the individual consumers using the, the consumer product to bring us. And was there another solution that you looked at or another couple of solutions? So, yeah, as we got to the point where we were going to put dollars behind this, we started looking at all a, a ton of other companies, so brands in our space, and this is kind of like homework we did before shipping to the legal team. Of what are what are other brands doing in our space? Not that they're perfect, but what do they have? Um, what are giant brands doing? So Fortune 500s. What's part of their process? And you know, what do our 
um, like quasi direct competitors do. And we ended up finding that a few of them were using homegrown portals, a few of them were using Google Doc Airtable things, um, and a few of them were using uh, OneTrust, which was, you know, and is this big enterprise company that creates portals for uh, companies that are large enough to do big integrations. And so OneTrust was the other company we looked at. And there were, were two things going through the sales cycle with OneTrust that um, were a little bit tough for us to swallow. One was just the, the general level of investment required to get it up and running was far beyond what I was willing to invest alongside like one other developer to implement this, this project. And two, the integrations were, and the, the things that the team was proud of as they were selling the solution to us was like integration with NetSuite and like SAP and all these really big systems, Salesforce that we weren't individually using that our teams were not gonna be using in the near future. And so we, we, we ran into this point of view of like, well, we really need things that have one-click integrations to, to Klaviyo or one-click integrations to MailChimp. And that's the bread and butter is like, if those are automated, that's most of the time we're spending anyway. And to one trust, the understanding was that that integration didn't take any less time than a big like NetSuite SAP integration. So we, we, we quickly found that it was just overpowered for the, the team size that we were. Uh, and a lot of the consent management things we just weren't, weren't ready for. So um, that conversation kind of took care of itself at, at the pricing level, but um, the, the direct integrations that we found with all the like SMB, like direct consumer Shopify toolkit kind of stuff that, that exists um, were, were really what just made mine a no-brainer. Amazing, amazing. I really appreciate that um, and appreciate mine for that reason. Um, can you just tell us, you know, how long did it take for you guys to get up and running with mine? And, you know, was there anything you particularly enjoy as a developer about working with mine? Yeah, so there, I, I would categorize our rollout in two phases. One was the initial link of the Gmail accounts of managers on our team to the mine platform. And it went through and looked at the subject lines and senders of all the emails. And it created this giant list of everywhere from like every exec team lead in the company, what admin accounts you know, do they conceivably have access to? And so what it meant is that, okay, we have someone on the team that has a full story account, which is like a, a user session recording software. Like, let's track down, I can see who that, who, what manager that is and ask, do you actually use it? Are you sending customer data there? So that's how we started with just this giant list of uh, discovery from the mind system. Um, and there's a little bit of a leak of faith, right? Linking uh, Gmail accounts, but you know, for us, it worked, their business accounts. And we ended up with a list of like 100 different sources and we went through there and said, okay, is this you know, really something we send customer data to or did we do a sales demo with them? And so their email popped up there, that kind of thing. Uh, and so we took that list and then looked at the ones where we have PII, like data about customers that we needed to keep track of and uh, either delete or inform customers what we have stored for them and narrowed it down to I think we're like 22 different sources today of places where, you know, a relatively small team under 50 people are, are sending data out to that we need to track. And I think the number of places I was deleting data with my individual form was less than that. So we found, found new ones that, that we hadn't discovered before. Um, and so just getting a handle on everything was phase one. And that was like two days, like wow. everyone down to link their account. And then I had the list. The, the rollout of the integration to make it usable where I was no longer doing management of request, inbound request from a, a Google Sheet process all the way through to it being automated in my platform was a couple of weeks. Um, mostly just like it wasn't the first thing I spent start to finish on the whole day. I did it in between other things, but um, yeah, for, for an individual developer who was fully focused on it, the actual dev integration time is a couple of hours it's just grabbing API keys and uh, a lot of things, different accounts together to, to get them connected. Um, yeah, so trial and error and like how quickly that all went. But the, the mind team is, you know, built a couple custom integrations for us that I went on vacation for a few weeks, came back and, and they were there. So um, I think we've, uh, you know, can I take responsibility for being the person bugging about segment and amplitude? Yeah, like, so those are there for the next person, but at the time, they were new. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, and um, I remember that you mentioned something uh, previously when we were talking about you know uh, changing uh, you know regulations and kind of how you used to feel about that. I'd like to kind of like uh, end on that kind of note. If, uh, if you remember that that comment that you made to me. Um, yeah, and so this one it, it's a very salesy comment <laughs> to preface it, but uh, it was very genuine from my point of view in that going through GDPR, CCPA, both of those were like the first of their kind. They were interesting and novel to learn about. And from like someone who had some natural curiosity about doing this right versus just adding a cookie banner, it was a like, great, like not a bad use of my time. And I individually pick up some like professional expertise to move on to whatever I do in the future. But what kept me up at night before mine was the idea that like, okay, Delaware is going to do this and Oregon's going to do this and all these other states are going to want to do things. And it's not going to be as interesting or novel for me to like pick up the nuance of all this stuff. And so one, you know, I know that mine will have that covered well before. Like, for example, we don't have an iOS app published to the store right now, but other companies do in our space and we'll eventually build one. So when we get there, like mine's ahead of everything and we'll be keeping up with the regulations on on the Apple side with those features. And so if I, I happen to be watching the news and uh, you know it's January 2nd and four new states have put stuff into, uh, into action 2023, I don't have to worry about like one, the request from the marketing or legal team is gonna be there to like, are we covered? It's kind of like, I get to be excited about it from like a consumer point of view of like, great, I can zap my data out of those states and know that it's not going to create tons of work out of nowhere from a, a compliance point of view for our team uh, and there's this whole like portal uh in the, the mind system if you're logged in as a, a business user that just shows like this week in the latest news all the changes and they're you know they're well formatted blog post type things but even if i don't read those i know that it's going to be covered so there, there's a lot of trust there involved in you know like the, the team continuing to make that true but uh that's where the comfort comes on my end of this was a good tool because now i can be excited about new states in the u.s and new countries across world rolling this out um privacy regulations out without having to be the the bearer of the, the dev change on that exactly so so yeah so just to to, to to come kind of full circle before we um move over to you with the right that's that's really what we're really hoping to do here at mine you know whether it's goose chase which has great ideas coming from their customers, great things going on, and not having any of that awesome innovation, you know, blocked and stopped due to, you know, fear and uncertainty around regulation, having a really easy and accessible solution, really easy and accessible uh, experts who can give you understanding. And, uh, and just so that way, it's not going to be a project that people either put off or are scared of. Um, you know, our mascot is the... Uh, the ostrich in the rocket ship, right? Because at the end of the day, we all are ostriches, right? You know, we all sometimes when we're feeling overwhelmed, we kind of hide our head uh, rather than, you know, what here we're trying to do is take technology to take us to the moon. Uh, so really appreciate you, Matt, and really appreciate uh, that entire story. Um, Yuta, uh, now over for you. There I am, Stas. Shush. Excuse me. So um, really lovely to meet some other privacy practitioners. You know, it was a it was a really lonely time back in 2001 when I started in privacy, which is a really long time ago. And yes, I was an adult person. Um, and first of all, I have to uh, apologize because I have beagles sleeping in the room. So if uh, one of them wakes up and decides that the nail man is uh, a bothersome uh, uh, foreign agent, we might hear from them. But regardless, um, I'm here a lot for comic relief first to show you that you can make it 20 years without losing, you know, too much sleep and going completely gray. And secondly, to kind of give a little bit of a historical kind of perspective and maybe um, a little bit of framework behind how privacy programs kind of design are designed for success, how they scale from like entry level starting places all the way up to like some of the biggest companies in the world um, and how, you know, your design choices today, regardless of where you are in that kind of evolutionary journey, can kind of grow with your business because I'm certain everyone on this call and certainly these two great companies that have been highlighted want to go from you know where you are to you know take over the world as well. So 
I thought um, I would talk about a couple of things and, and she does keep me um, on track because I, I want to make sure that, first of all, I give you all the information that helps you win the uh, question and answer uh, trivia at the end of the uh, webinar, but also are kind of helpful and informative for if you're looking for a little bit of framework around which you design some programs and have conversations. And, you know, the title of this is uh, Balancing Customer Experience, Business Needs and Regulations. And I think that is the hardest thing in the world to do if you don't have a plan and you don't have framework to rely on. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll quickly start by saying I started my life as an engineer, not as a, as a compliance official. And I kind of went through a couple of evolutionary pivots where I kind of got into policy in a really significant way and studied privacy at Carnegie Mellon in the early days because I was really nervous about some of the technology I was building for government. And then I went into um, consulting work where we were building programs before there was really legal interpretation on this topic of privacy and then kind of like took a back seat to the legal conversation around whether or not um, information was really a personal asset if it was a date it was a data subject owned asset or if it was a company owned um, collector asset and whether or not cookies were even private information but a majority of my career I spent in the healthcare industry and in healthcare, privacy was never a question. It was just an ex every person that worked in healthcare was an extension of the doctor patient private um, confidential promise. And so I didn't combat any you know, real friction in adopting privacy best practice for a lot of my career because it was just embedded in culture. So a lot of my approach to building privacy programs is around awareness, culture development, and helping every person who works within a company embrace their accountability or responsibility for ensuring people's data is protected. So um, one of the things uh, Stasha, you and I talked about were, um, was kind of, if you're small, you know, what's your, what's the iterative approach to building programs so that it's kind of right-sized for who you are, um, but also foundational or building block for who you want to become. And, uh, you know, in my earliest career, I worked for Department of Defense and in defense, uh, we had a really strong um, adherence to a concept called capability maturity modeling, CMM, or CMMI if you were doing integration work. And I think privacy falls very clearly in CMMI kind of best practice. And we kind of gauged all of our investments on this five point scale of whether we were doing something for the first time and it was very ad hoc, um, whether we were doing it in a little bit more of a, of a kind of def defined way, which would be kind of CMMI level three, or if we were like quantitatively managing things and really measuring performance, or if we were really working toward optimization where we had a continuous improvement kind of strategy. And when I compare our obligations under law, so you have your entry point, which is like, oh my gosh, I got to figure this out for the very first time. And maybe I'm going to use um, a DPO at my company email address for any inbound uh, data deletion requests. Or if you're going to do something a little bit more defined and use your Google form Matt, that you mentioned for collecting some of these requests. Or if you're going to invest in some technology that's really going to measure your performance against a standard um, like we can do with some of the, you know, really quick to use products in from mine. Or if you're going to go into that really highly automated, optimized place where you have automation kind of fulfilling those requests in a really um, uh, speedy, almost near time, near real time basis. Um, all of that is something that you can plan for, but you don't have to implement right away. It's one of my favorite parts of the mind technical stack is that you can self-select where you are on that kind of maturity scale and build and spend time and money on the pieces that make sense for who you are today. So that's one of the reasons I love the mind product first and foremost. Um, the other question I get asked a lot when I go and talk with companies about why should I buy a product versus build a product? Um, I worked for some pretty big engineering companies and we have great strong engineering uh, capable people like Matt and Alex I'm very impressed as a person with a legal background that you have that's kind of technical knowledge by the way um, is why should I buy a product it seems really simple I can build a form and put it on my web page and we we talked a little bit about kind of what you're trying to achieve with a product uh, that's kind of helping in the way that mine helps and I would say two things one is there, at the end of a really long course at Carnegie Mellon on the economics of outsourcing with lots of statistics and math and, and, and things that I don't use in my daily life any longer, the net net of kind of the, the whole course was if you're very small or extremely large, your best value proposition is to buy a product, not build it, um, or to outsource it uh, rather than try to do it in-house, unless it's part of your very core capability. 
Um, and if it's part of what you produce as a, as a company, your, your, your secret sauce, then definitely build. But if it's not part of your very core competency, your best economic benefit is to outsource things that are not um, of value to you. And that's true for very small companies, like, you know, if you're early in your development life cycle or very, very large companies. And I've seen that play out at big companies like Google that outsource large chunks of administrative function um, and very small companies that, of course, don't want to be building you know, an HR system. So it's only when you're in that mid to medium large tier that it makes sense to, to really focus on you know, developing in-house. So I would I would recommend for all of you, if you don't have really large privacy organizations or a lot of privacy engineering staff, that it's probably a best economic benefit to outsource to a company that does this as their core competency. Um, what else? I want to make sure I cover all these things. Yeah, um, I want to talk about regulation and conversations that you're all going to be having very soon. Um, here in the United States, we have new law that's being proposed that has supersedence um, authority over all the state law that's been passing and that you know mine's been keeping track of for all of you. And the ADPPA, uh, which is the proposed rule right now, is um, um, one of the one assurances in there that's really concerning uh, or should be concerning to you all is uh, a private right to action for any privacy violations. So until very recently, until um, California statute actually, uh, there was no private right to action for privacy violations just inherently. You had to prove damages and if you wanted to sue in civil court, you had to actually demonstrate that you were damaged as a person in order for you to be able to seek compensation from a company that experienced a data breach. And it's very hard to do because there are so many data breaches that it was very easy to defend that a person's harm, maybe their identity was stolen, occurred because of your breach as opposed to some other event. So in California, there was a $1,000 auto grant for any data breach victim that you didn't have to prove damages, you were automatically awarded a $1,000 damages kind of opportunity. And that is now being um, reiterated in the new federal rules in the United States as well. So when I talk about products like mine, um, and mine in particular, frankly, uh, my rationale for buying a suite that looks like something you could build in-house is that it is comprehensive, it's consistent, and it's contained. And it becomes a very useful defense tool for anyone who's operating a legal defense, either from a civil dispute or from a, from a regulatory inquiry. And so having it be contained, complete, and, and controlled makes it an incredibly useful defensive tool if you're ever going to be kind of defending the privacy work that you're doing. And since the, the private right to action is now, um, it's, it's related to exercise of the specific rights that are defined by the product itself, you know, deletion, mobility, um, amendment, uh, notice, these sorts of things, it's, it's a fantastic comprehensive tool that you can implement very easily to create a defensible position. Because I think when you look at CMMI, I was taking some notes because I was loving the conversation earlier. If you look at you know what are goals for your company, your first goal may be, I want to be compliant, which is kind of an initial entry point from a maturity perspective. And your next goal might be, I want to be defensible. And then after that, I want to be super consistent in my defense. And then I want to be better and then I want to be best. And if you put those on a scale, your investment can grow over time. But first being compliant and being defensible, I think you can do with one-click accuracy and, and one-click speed using uh, a product like mine. All right, so I covered a lot of ground. Sorry, Stosh, I just went off. But... No, no, it's good. Now we just got a couple questions. That way people can do the quiz correct. Ready? Yes. Letter of the alphabet for the dogs. Well, I put my, my I, I made this beautiful painting of my dog, Beavis. And over here across from me is Bailey. And over here is my other dog, um, uh, what's his name? Bud, uh, Bodhisattva. And then my previous beagles were Budweiser, um, Baxter, and Boondoggle. So that, that will help you in, in your... In your uh, it will thing. indeed. And, and to optimize a privacy program, not to be... Uh, we have to talk about structure, right? Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about structure and I won't give you the exact answer like I just did, but um, people come to me and say, well, um, I'm very small or I'm very large. Should I have a centralized privacy organization um, or should I have a decentralized privacy organization? And I think that there's a spectrum of investment 
where a lot of companies will start with a, a very decentralized approach to privacy where there's a couple some education perhaps and product teams across a company are, are are educated to the requirements of law but maybe don't have very specific technical guidance that's given to them or an obligation to mandate and that's very typical in, in kind of an entry place with uh, privacy and then um, over time they'll evolve to be a little bit more standardized so you'll get to that, that finally to that um, the seven elements of a compliance program include, you know, first and foremost, you know, des designating authority, then writing down policies, procedures, and guidance, um, and then going into a monitoring or a training and education, then monitoring, and then just, you know, reporting and investigation before you have to demonstrate that you had enforced discipline. Um, and those, by the way, are defined in the federal sentencing guidelines, not in privacy law. It's, it's, um, it's the expectation for managing consistent change. Um, or optimized change or continuously improving change for any regulatory um, obligation in the country, whether it's washing your hands before cooking food, driving on the road, or privacy, you have to demonstrate a commitment to all seven of those steps in order for you to be defensible in a sentencing position situation. So it's in the federal sentencing guidelines. Um, based on that, if you, if you define a standardized or a centralized position for your privacy program or any regulatory compliance program, you can guarantee that you're meeting that like third tier of CMMI, that managed, defined, you've written it down, and now you're, you have kind of a consistent way of approaching it. Um, but if you're decentralized, it's very difficult to be defensive that you're actually meeting the commitments that are required by the federal sentencing guidelines. So whether you start to decentralized, write some standard practices, and then maybe eventually standardize, when you're, I'm sorry, centralized. When you're centralized, you can truly optimize a program, but you really can't meet even a regulatory minimum of managed if you're if you're decentralized um, completely. That makes and sense. The last question, yeah, yeah. And the last question before we go to audience questions is, does HIPAA provide a right to action? It does not, everybody. So under HIPAA, which was written in 1999 and not really massively, uh, it was actually written in 1995 and enacted in 99. It hasn't had a major revision in the modern technical age, um, but it was a very extensible framework for privacy protections and it's been interpreted through enforcement actions um, according to new technical advancements, but it never provided for a private right to action, which meant that the only authority that could ever penalize a healthcare company for failure to meet a HIPAA standard was the Office for Civil Rights in the United States. California's new rule and this proposed federal rule are the first time. So there's not a lot of experience in the legal field in defending against um, these cases. Um, and so there's not a lot of learning that can be kind of garnered. And from my experience, that means that a lot of the legal interpretation that comes especially from outside counsel is the interpretation that is going to bear the most potential liability, it's going to cover the most potential liability for your business, which doesn't mean it's a really great trade-off recommendation or a really great, um, uh, like it's not really great advice if you're willing to accept a certain degree of risk. So um, I guess my point when I talk about HIPAA is when there was no private right to action, you didn't have to worry so much from an enforcement perspective because it was rare, the likelihood of enforcement was very low and therefore the risk was actually quite low. Um, but with private right to action becoming um, the next stage of, of kind of privacy um, enforcement in the United States, especially um, the threshold for proof is going to go way, way down and your defensibility, your ability to defend in court is going to depend on your record keeping, which is why I highly recommend a company like mine um, to be kind of the central source of record keeping for your defensibility. Yeah, go mine. I wonder yeah. who's hosting this webinar. I mean, who knows? <laughs> Uh, cool. So, uh, so great. So we're almost at time. So we always like to uh, go to a couple questions um, just before we then share with you guys the link, uh, which you guys can then use to do the quiz. And then again, we will be selecting uh, the top uh, probably 20 or 30% uh, of scores. Um, so great. So in terms of the next step, um, uh, where should we get those questions? Um, let's take a look. Anything in the chat? Okay. Uh, okay. So we have a couple other questions that were sent over. Here we go. Okay. Um, so this is a question for Alex. Uh, years ago, there was a national security challenge with the Fitbit highlighted a hotspot in a conflict zone. How did the trade-off uh, conversation initially go when green lighting, developing for military law enforcement features and projects? 
Yeah, for sure. I mean, so that's, I mean, especially what happened with Fitbit was, uh, was a bit of a shit show for lack of a better word. Uh, especially when you look at the, the heat map from Strava, that was pretty wild. Uh, no, so for us, we were super fortunate to have a really open conversation with our customers. Um, and so, and this is really where the guest accounts emanated from, whereby the difference, I'd say, really between us and, and Fitbit, firstly, we don't actually get uh, lo location data, so we don't actually use GPS, unlike, of course, Fitbit that needs it to record how many steps you take or don't take, in my case. Uh, and differently as well, for Fitbit, you need a subscription. That's mainly what leaked is kind of subscription information, the, the subscribers and the accounts under that. Whereas for um, military personnel, it's very much locked. So a lot of the features that we would normally offer to some customers would be restricted to others, and that is deliberately done. So it's done in a way that is very open. So so they kind of know what the trade-off is and for what reason. Um, and so in that case, very much it's uh, guest accounts only. So really, if someone were to just hack us, they would just see a string of code. So they wouldn't be able to distinguish between a military member and a five-year-old uh, preschool uh, student. So yeah, that's kind of how we've done it. Um, but there's, there's certainly a lot more to, to, to be done. But yeah, so that's like, hopefully they will have a heat map of, of goose chase. Amazing. So I'm, I'm just going to share over the quiz in case anybody does have to drop right now. And we will, of course, email it over to anybody. Um, but we're going to go on with a couple more questions just in case, just making sure can people do a couple more minutes or does it any hard stops for our speakers? OK, cool. So we're just going to do a couple more minutes just to keep on going through the, the, the questions. but. There is the um, the quiz for anybody who does have to drop, and we will email it uh, later. Awesome. So the next question, um, this is uh, another one for Alex, I believe, right, Batia? Yeah. Okay. Any key tips on getting started when creating and optimize privacy rights experiences for so many different personas? Okay. So any any key tips when you have different uh, privacy rights for so many different experiences for different personas. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so it, it, I'd say it really depends. So I would not, so I think for us, we're quite lucky that we were able to kind of take on new customers as it went. I would say, and I'm pretty sure everyone else on the call will also agree, try to, whether it's, G, whether it's a specific legislation or a particular customer, sensitive customer, try to really go to the most extreme customer you may have, right? So we try to, so the, the really the data that we have that is perhaps the most sensitive, along with military members, it is also uh, our students, um, so simply because, you know, they're, they're, they're young and the data is incredibly important. So we really have them in mind, first and foremost, we really have built a bit of a customer persona of who we're kind of creating those laws for and uh, those are uh, those uh, products and features for and more importantly who we really are trying to protect right so even if you have five ten fifteen different types of customers try to distill it to the most important person so the most sensitive person you're trying to protect and more often than not the features that you'll develop for them will be applicable to others right uh so same with military members you know, they're applicable to, to kind of interns onboarding for XYZ company, right? So uh, so that's kind of where I would start is creating this archetype. Amazing. Okay, thank you. At next one, next question, here we have, uh, how do you guys keep up with the evolving regulations and guidelines? So anything that's changing, how do you guys keep on top of that? Anybody want to grab it? Well, I, I subscribe to a number of services, one of which is, you know, um, supplier white page bears, because this is their core competency. So they're going to let me know when things are getting to the point where its action is warranted. I also belong to a couple of industry associations, um, and I read a lot of the, the kind of news uh, kind of channels that LinkedIn recommends to me. Um, when when I worked in healthcare, we, we kind of collected the amount of regulatory guidance that came out in a kind of 10 year span. And it was over 16,000 pieces of written communication about expectations and obligations in healthcare. It's an incredible amount. So we, uh, when you're dealing with really large scale like that, we had an ingest um, set of lawyers. Uh, they put it into a system. We kind of homogenized the requirements and found out whether or not they overlapped with other existing requirements. 
anything that was a Delta, we would ship to whatever clinical team was expected to, to meet that obligation and get a written response on readiness and then have like a, a triage process and, and, op, and, a, and a reporting on, on kind of like uh, timelines, dependencies and kind of completion periods because th th that would affect basically whether or not the company was profitable or not if we, if we failed to deliver on some of those requirements. I, I follow the same practice in privacy. Um, I wait until rules are really pretty solid because there's a lot of machination that goes into the require a, an actual requirement being live. And then there are some surprises. There's some some really like big pushes like the DMA and DSA that just came out in Europe that were really fast tracked and, and happened super quickly. Um, I would make one pitch, which is to be a contributor to the process and not just a, a victim of the process. I sat on ISO standards committees forever, and you can do that for no money. <laughs> you can join and be a technical expert committee, um, contributing to technical standards as well as like policy standards for almost free. Um, and I, I would say that that gives you a real heads up on what's coming and you can actually kind of coax and change some of the rules that are coming uh, um, when they're really not practical or realistic. Um, so being part of the proactive part of it, but then also kind of subscribing to new sources that um, can kind of filter out the noise because there's a lot of noise. Others probably have better recommendations too. Amazing, amazing. That's really helpful. And for anybody who doesn't have the uh, training and the ability, of course, we do have the DPO advisor. That actually was not one that came from us, so it uh, wasn't a plug for us, but it's, uh, it's good to keep that in mind. Um, cool. So really quick, another last one for Matt. Uh, are there any things that you prefer to keep manual in your process? You know, as a developer, somebody who loves automation, is there anything that you personally are like, I'm going to keep this manual, and if so, why? Yeah, so this is this is a great one. We've run into this kind of pre-mine, post-mine integrations. Um, but anything where you're dealing with core data that's required to run the business and could be auditable in the future, uh, and specifically if we're thinking about the payment customer data type of things more than like analytics, like sure, it would be nice for a product manager in two years to be able to go back seven years of data and have it all. Like some of that has to be given up in pursuit of, of privacy. But if someone needs to look at a payment on a customer in Stripe, uh, managing something that happened seven years ago, that needs to be there. And so as people are building these tools and integrations, it's very tempting to take a delete my information request and say, sure, we'll zap it. Uh, and in some cases, these platforms will allow you to do that. Stripe's not one of them. They'll you know, maintain the data because it's, it's required for their operations too. Um, but you'll want to take a look with your teams at the core things that maybe the, uh, the core web application relies upon there being a customer object. I zap at some point a customer object in Stripe and it deleted it there to the point of, uh, you know, only having what would be needed for an audit or legal obligation in the future. But the web application was still trying to grab that customer ID. So we had to like do a bunch to fix that user. So we're, we're closely in collaboration and just expect that there's some learnings uh, as you go, but especially around full deletion of data, um, pay co close attention to uh, any negative impact that might have to, to user experience and balance it out for the things that you can. Amazing. Amazing, amazing. And you know, it's a good party when uh, the time's over and people are still hanging out. So uh, I really appreciate it. Um, really love everybody being here. Uh, so here we've just put the, uh, the link to the quiz uh, up for everybody. We also shared it before. Uh, please go ahead and give it a try. Um, we'd love to hear any comments. Uh, we'll obviously send over uh, the recording and the link to the quiz for anybody who didn't get a shot to it now. And, uh, and yeah, I really want to thank everybody for joining us. We really love this community. It's fun bringing people in who are interested in having these conversations, learning from each other and yeah, you know, going through it together and learning from one another and having fun as we do it. So, uh, I want to thank you guys all again. Um, any, any words from uh, the speakers just before we uh, close it out, any words of advice to take into the wilderness? No. Uh, okay. Yeah, just uh, be, be an active participant. Uh, I think there's lots of opportunity for, uh, taking what a legal team might advise a smaller company to do as the word of the land, but 
in a lot of cases, uh, providing 10 examples of here's what I'm seeing in the industry, which one fits is a much better place to start from a Bill Blower's point of view for the, the legal team, but also in getting the end result that you might want as a product owner. Uh, and, you know, it's really product development process, but don't let it be in the legal team or policy that's that's written in law um, scare you away from doing what's right for your customers because there's happy medium. Thanks, everyone. Absolutely. And in the words of Alex, it's wine time. So I uh, want to thank everybody again for joining. Uh, it's about 8 p.m. here in Tel Aviv, but I'm sure it's also 8 p.m. in a lot of other places, right? So everybody can enjoy, right? So anyways, thank you all so much for joining. Yuta, Alex, Matt, we love you guys. Till the next time, all the best. Bye-bye. Cheers, all. Thanks. Thank you. Bye.